Hi, everybody. Welcome back to our time of learning the Ten Commandments. Let's start by reviewing the commandments that we've learned so far. You ready? Here we go. First commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. Commandment number two, you shall not make idols or bow down to them or serve them. Number three, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Number four, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And last week, we got to the middle. Commandment number five, honor your father and your mother. All right. Well, this week, we are at commandment number six. So we're at the last half of the Ten Commandments. So here's a picture I've got for commandment number six. What do you see here in this picture? We see a person with some flowers, and we see something that looks sort of like a tombstone. So this is somebody visiting someone's grave. So someone has died. So what do you think that means our commandment has to do with? It has to do with dying. And the commandment is, you shall not murder. So let's take a look at our poster. You can see, you shall not murder, commandment number six. And it's on the second tablet here of the Ten Commandments. And remember, the first tablet, the first five commandments that we learned, or the first four commandments that we learned, really, had to do with how we relate to God and how we treat God. Number five, we learned last week, honor your father and your mother, has to do with how we treat God and how we treat our parents, other people. So it's kind of in the middle there because it falls into both camps. And so this week, we're going to start on the commandments that have to do with how we treat one another. And so the first one of those commandments is number six, you shall not murder. Now, this is one of those commandments where everybody would say, you know what, this is kind of a no brainer. I know that this is not something we should do. We should not kill other people. In fact, even people who are not Christians, people who do not um, believe in God even, everybody, for the most part, widely believes that you should not kill other people. We just know instinctively that that is not something that we should do. But as with all the other commandments, it's still important to know why that commandment was given so that we can understand not only how we should obey it, but what is the sin that can cause us to break that commandment. So the question is, why is murder wrong? Now that might seem like a silly question. We know it's wrong, but why? So let's take a look in the Bible, and there's kind of some specific reasons that tell us why murder is wrong, aside from the ones that we already know. All right, so here's what the Bible has to say about murder. We shouldn't murder because Genesis 1.27 tells us that all people are created in the image of God. So I'm going to read Genesis 127 here for you. Right at the very beginning of my Bible. It says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So all people have been created by God. And the Bible tells us that all people have been created in God's own image. So we bear the marks and the... Um, identifications that we have been created by God and for God. So as God's image bearers, we are special and valuable because we are created in God's image. So to murder or to kill someone is to destroy something that has been created in the image of God and that is valuable to him. All right. Another reason Romans 13, 9 tells us, and this is probably the one that we're most familiar with. This is what we think of. We think of, well, murder is just, that's mean. It's terrible and it's wrong. And you're right. And this is what scripture tells us in Romans chapter 13, verse nine, it says for the commandments, and then it lists them and says, you shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not covet. And any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So scripture tells us, the Bible tells us that we are to love our neighbors as ourselves. That means that we would love and do for others as we would want done for us. And we treat others the way we would want to be treated. Now, I certainly would not want to be killed. And so I certainly should not want to kill other people. But I should want to love my neighbors. 
I should want to do good to them and not to harm them. And so obviously to kill someone is not to love our neighbors. And then one more, this is an important one. This is found in Revelation chapter 21, verse eight, the very last book of the Bible. And this verse, again, it goes on to, um, it lists a, a bunch of different things that people have done. And it says, for the cowardly, the faithless, it goes on and says, as for murderers and others, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. So this is talking about the final judgment. And it says that for those people who are murderers, that is the life that they've chosen. That is what they've decided to do. There is, they will not be inheriting the kingdom of God. Instead, they will be going to the lake of fire. Now, we know that scripture tells us, does God forgive all sins, even the sin of murder? Can God forgive those sins? Absolutely. And we've got examples in the Bible of people who committed murder or had murder, um, conspired to commit murder or had other people murder on their behalf. And those people, when they came to God in repentance and asked for forgiveness, they were forgiven. That's such a great example of God's mercy that even the biggest and the most terrible of sins, God can forgive if we are willing to submit to him and if we are willing to repent and turn from those ways to stop doing evil and to turn to do good. So talking about those who will not inherit the kingdom of God are the people who do not repent of this, of this sin of murder. They will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, wait, there's one more thing that we need to talk about because I'm sure at this point you're thinking, well, you know what? This is not a commandment I'm going to break. I have no intention of killing anybody. I know that it's wrong. I can see that it's wrong. It's not something I want to do. I'm never going to break this commandment. Guess what? The Bible has something to say to all of us who think we wouldn't break this commandment. All right. Matthew 15, 19 tells us that murder, just like any other sin, begins in the heart. It's not just something that randomly happens. It starts with a thought. And it's, those thoughts start in the heart. So I'm going to read to you Matthew 15, 19. It says, For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, and then others as well. And it says, These are what defile a person. So it's saying that your heart is where murder begins. That's where that thought, that idea begins in your heart. So we know that that's where it starts, but Jesus goes on and tells us something even more. In Matthew 5, 21 and 22, this is what he says. So we might have those thoughts in our heart, but this is what Jesus tells us. He says, you have heard that it was said of, to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. So what Jesus was saying in this commandment is, if you hate and have anger towards anybody, that's where murder starts. And that is the same thing as having committed murder and broken the sixth commandment. So we might be able to say, well, no, I've never actually physically killed anyone and I really don't plan to ever do that. But have you ever had hate in your heart towards somebody and anger that's just made you really angry? Jesus says that's the same thing. So we are still guilty of breaking that commandment. So how do we avoid breaking this commandment? We need to guard our hearts. That means we need to be careful of the thoughts that we are having in our hearts and in our minds towards other people. And if we are angry and hateful towards someone, even if we haven't been outwardly hateful or angry to them, if we've been harboring those thoughts in our minds, we need to confess that sin to God. Whenever we have anger or hate towards another person, we need to confess that sin to God. We need to repent of it. And we need to do, as we were told, to love our neighbor as ourselves. And so that's the key, the key from keeping us from 
bad and sinful thoughts that lead to bigger sins. The key is to confessing our sins and to loving God and loving our neighbor. All right, well, it's time now for the perfect 10. So today's lesson was number six. I think this is a lot of uh, our favorite one for us. Don't get your kicks. So remember to give a little kick by killing one another. All right, so let's sing together. One, two, three. Number one, we've just begun. God should be first in your life. Number two's the idol rule. Those graven images aren't nice. Number three, God's name should be never spoken in jest. Number four, the Sabbath for our worship and for rest. Number five, we all should strive to honor father and mother. Number six, don't get your kicks from killing one another. Number seven, life is heaven when you're true to your mate. Number eight, don't steal and break this rule for goodness sake. Number nine, don't be the kind who goes around telling lies. Number 10, don't covet when you see your neighbor's house or wife. That's the list that God insists we stay away from these sins. That is why we memorize commandments one through 10. Good job. So that's commandment number six to remember this week. You shall not murder. All right, so you can continue to look at your 10 commandments door hangers that you made a few weeks ago and go over these other commandments and think about this week. You know, think about ways that maybe you've been angry or hateful towards other people and ask God to help you to uh, show you ways that um, maybe that you have been guilty of breaking this commandment and you can ask him for forgiveness. That is the wonderful thing that because of what Jesus did on the cross, because he died to pay for our sins, that even when we break these commandments, God gives us forgiveness because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. So if you have asked Jesus into your heart, if you have asked him to forgive you of your sins, if you've asked him to be your savior, then you can know when you ask for your forgiveness that it's covered. And if you haven't asked Jesus, to be your savior. And that's something that you want to do. I encourage you to find an adult, someone that you can talk to about um, asking Jesus into your heart and about having him as your savior. So have a good week, everybody. And we will see you next week for commandment number seven. Bye. We're going to sing the old rugged cross and we're going to sing the first verse and the third verse. And we're going to sing the chorus through twice. Let's sing together.
Good morning. Has this ever happened in your house? Have your parents ever said, go clean up your room and then we'll go to the park? Or maybe they said, put away your toys and then we'll have some ice cream. So there's a reward in front of you, a promise of something fun you're going to be able to do, but first you have a responsibility. Today we're going to learn about some promises that God gave to Joshua. And we know that God is always faithful to keep his promises. We're also going to learn that Joshua had some responsibilities as well. Do you remember those 12 spies? Only Joshua and Caleb believed God and wanted to obey him. As a result, none of the other Israelites who were 20 years old or older got to receive the promise of God because of their unbelief. There are big consequences if we do not obey or do we do not believe God's word. I want you to turn with me in, in the Bible to the book of Joshua. Now Joshua is the sixth book of the Bible. We know where that's at because we've been learning them. So Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua. So find the book of Joshua, chapter 1, and we're going to read verses 1 through 4. Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea, toward the going down of the sun, shall be your coast. Now, who are the two people talked about in this passage? Well, in verse 1, we see the Lord is speaking, and he's speaking to Joshua. Now, what happened before this time? Verse 1 tells us, and as well, verse 2 tells us that before this time, Moses had died. And what else do we see? What was it that the Lord commanded Joshua to do? Well, he gave him some instructions. He was to take the people and lead them across the Jordan River into the promised land. Now, the promised land, we're going to talk about that a lot through this time, and the promised land might also be called the land of Canaan. And so if you, we say promised land or the land of Canaan, we're talking about the same thing. Well, Joshua had a very big job to do. All those people who had been 20 years old or younger when they came out of Egypt were now 60 years old or younger, and they were ready to go into the promised land. Finally, God's promise that he had made to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to Moses, to all of Israel was going to be fulfilled. That second part about the land. Wow, this is really exciting. Do you remember what that land was like? Was it just empty, sitting there, ready for them to come in? No. Remember, it had great fenced cities, and there were many people, and the people were big. This was a big job that God gave to Joshua. Now, let's keep reading and find out what God said to Joshua before they went into the promised land. We're going to go back to the book of Joshua, chapter 1, and read verses 5 through 9. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Be strong and of a good courage, for unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous, 
that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Have not I commanded thee? Be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. Now, God said that he would be with Joshua just like he had been with someone else before Joshua. Who was that? Do you see that in verse 5? It was Moses. And God gave Joshua two promises in verse 5. Look at that verse again. The first promise was that no one was going to be able to stand before him. God was going to give Joshua and the people victory in their battles. What was the other promise that God gave to Joshua? There in verse 5 it says, that God said he would never leave Joshua nor forsake him. So what we're going to do today is make a chart. One part will be Joshua's responsibilities and the other will be God's promises. Let's see that, okay? Now, where would we add the promise that God was going to give Joshua victory? All right, that's right. We're going to put that on God's responsibilities. Where would we add the promise that God would never leave Joshua? Would we put that under Joshua or under God? Well, again, it goes under God's promise. So God promised Joshua victory if he would be strong and courageous. God also promised Joshua that he would never leave him. Now, God commanded Joshua to do something. In fact, he commanded him to do it three times, so it must be very important. Can you see what it is? Look back there in your Bible to Joshua chapter 1. We're going to look at verses 6, 7, and 9. Can you see it there? Be strong and of a good courage. Verse 7, only be thou strong and very courageous. In verse 9, have not I commanded thee, be strong and and of a good courage. Pretty easy to see, right? So what was God's command to Joshua? It was to be strong and courageous. What does it mean to be strong and of a good courage? Well, it means to be brave. Don't be afraid. Keep trusting God that he would keep his promises to Joshua. Now, how was Joshua supposed to go up against all those nations and win? Let's go back to Joshua chapter 1 and find out. Look at verses 7 and 8 again. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success." So what was Joshua supposed to observe? Verse 7 says he was to observe all the law. What was Joshua supposed to talk about? What was supposed to always be on his lips and in his thoughts? Well, verse 8 tells us it is the book of the law was to be always on his lips and always in his mind. And not only was he to think about it, and to talk about it, these were his responsibilities, but he was also to be obedient to it and do it. So 
Let's go back to our chart. What was Joshua's responsibilities? He was to be strong and courageous, believe God's word. He was to observe and obey the law. And what else? He was to be what? Be obedient to it. That's right. He was to actually do what he had read there. So after 40 years wandering in the wilderness, God was telling the Israelites, it's time to take over the land of the, and the people who lived there. You know what? Those people were probably just as afraid as their parents had been. But God had promised them victory, and he promised he would never leave them. Do you remember what it says in verse 9? This is going to be our new memory verse for a while. Let's review what verse 9 says. Have not I commanded thee? Be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. So let's sum up or review everything we've learned from Joshua chapter 1. What were Joshua's responsibilities? They were that they, he was to be strong and courageous. He was to trust God. He was to observe and obey the law. And he was to be obedient. So where was Joshua going to get his strength and courage from? He was going to get it as he meditated, thought about, talked about, and did God's law. Now that doesn't just mean the Ten Commandments, but all of the Word of God. God gave Joshua strength and courage to do what he commanded him to do as Joshua learned and obeyed the Word of God. God also made some promises to Joshua. There was a promise of blessing for Joshua's obedience. It was that God would give him victory over the people of the land. And also, it was that God would never leave him and that God would grant Joshua success and prosper him. Joshua had a very tough job. He was to lead the people of Israel to take over a big land. And it was going to be hard. God told him how to do it. He was supposed to obey the word of God. He was to think about it and to know it. And he was supposed to do it. This was the only way that Joshua could have good success. We can learn from this too. God wants us to obey him just like he commanded Joshua to obey. When we obey God's word, we have the strength and the courage to do what God asks us to do. We can also have the confidence that just as God was with Joshua, God will be with us too. Now this seems like a difficult thing to do sometimes, doesn't it? In the New Testament, we see Jesus as our example, as he believed and obeyed God's word and was able to stand strong against the devil when he tried to tempt him. After Jesus had been in the wilderness for 40 days without food, the devil came to him and three times he tried to get Jesus to sin. Each time, Jesus used the word of God to answer the devil. Jesus never sinned and is the perfect example to us. Each time Jesus answered, it is written. He knew the word of God. Jesus never sinned and Joshua was an example to us too because he was obedient to God's word. We know that God is sovereign He's in control of everything. That means that God's will will always be accomplished. However, we have a responsibility to be obedient to the word of God and to fulfill his will. God uses 
obedient people to accomplish his will. This song is Trust and Obey, and this is one of the newer ones that we've been learning as well. Um, we're going to sing the first verse and the last verse, and we're going to sing the chorus two times. So let's sing Trust and Obey together. Hi everybody, welcome back to our memory verse time. We've got a brand new theme verse that we're going to be learning this week, but before we do that, let's review the bonus verse that we've been working on for the past couple of weeks. The bonus verse was Psalm 90 verses 1 and 2. It was a psalm written by Moses, and we're going to read it through together. We can uh, read it through with the words on the screen, and we'll do the actions, and then we're going to take the words away. All right? So let's give it a try. One, two, three. Psalm 90 verses one and two. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, forever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Good job. Did you get all of those actions in, including the ones we learned last week? All right. Well, let's give it one last go here. We're going to take the words away and we're going to say it all together. Ready? One, two, three. Psalm 90 verses one and two. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations before the mountains were brought forth or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Great work, everybody. Okay, are you ready to see our new theme verse for the next few weeks? All right, so our new theme verse is found in the book of Joshua, and it's Joshua chapter 1, verses nine, verse 9. Now, we're going to be learning in the weeks to come about Joshua and about his leadership over the people of Israel as they settled into the promised land that God had promised way back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So this verse is the Lord speaking to Joshua as he is now replaced Moses as the leader of the Israelites. And it says, have I not commanded you be strong and of good courage do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So the Lord was saying to Joshua that if Joshua was true to God, if he obeyed, followed his word, trusted God, that God is going to be with him. So there was no need to be afraid or to be worried or discouraged because they were going to be coming up against some pretty um, big challenges a lot of different things happening, a lot of difficulties, a lot of things that would cause people to say, I don't know if we made the right choice. 
just like happened in the wilderness. But God says, if you trust me, you do not need to be worried or afraid. Just be strong and courageous, and I will be with you wherever you go. So we're going to start learning this verse, but we're going to do it differently than we've been doing it in the past. We're not going to use actions right now, but we're going to use pictures, right? So I'm going to bring up a poster of this verse, it's the same thing, but it looks very different, doesn't it? We've got pictures there to represent some of the different words. And then what we're going to do is we're going to start taking the pictures away little by little. But today we're just going to focus on learning the pictures and what each picture means to the word it represents. All right. So you can see we've got there, the first one we have is an eyeball that represents eye. And then we've got a rope tied in a knot. So that represents the word knot. And then we've got the letter U for you. We've got an arm for strong. And then you see there we've got a soldier who's at attention. He is going to represent the word courage because soldiers are very brave and they are known for their courage. So when you see the soldier picture, that's the word courage. And of course we have our little B friend for the word B. So whenever the word B pops up, you're gonna see that little guy. And we've got a girl with sort of a worried look on her face there. She represents the word afraid. So whenever you see the little girl, that's the word afraid. And then after that, we've got a little boy who's crying and he represents the word dismayed. And dismayed just means that, that you're discouraged and you're sad. So when you see the little crying boy, that's the word dismayed. So they kind of rhyme, there's afraid and dismayed. And we've got the number four for the word four. We've got a crown for Lord. We've got God there written in the big cloud with the stars. Then we have, again, U, the letter U. And we've got a girl who's sort of wandering on the street. That's for the word wherever, because she's kind of going wherever, right? So she represents the word wherever. Then we have a stoplight with the green light on. So what do you think that would mean? That means go. So that's the word go. And then we've got a picture at the end of Joshua. And that's for our reference, Joshua 1 verse 9. So why don't we try reading through this verse with the pictures, and then I'm going to give you a little quiz to see if you can remember what the pictures mean. All right, here we go. Have I not commanded you be strong and of good courage? Do not be afraid nor be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Joshua 1 9. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to say the verse, and when I come to one of the pictures, it's gonna come up on the screen. But you'll notice in the last poster, the picture had the word underneath as well. These pictures don't have the word underneath, so you're gonna have to remember what that picture represents okay so i'm going to say the verse bring up the picture and then you're going to tell me what word it is all right let's give it a try here we go have i not good commanded you be strong and of good, remember, courage. Do not be, remember what this little girl is? Afraid, okay. Nor be dismayed for the Lord, your God, is with you. Good. Remember this one is? Wherever you go. And our reference is, who is that? Joshua. Joshua 1.9. Very good. So 
that's what, how we're going to be learning this verse. And next week, we're going to try taking some of the pictures away instead of some of the words. So why don't we say it through one more time before we wrap up today? All right, let's go. One, two, three. Have I not commanded you be strong and of good courage? Do not be afraid nor be dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Joshua 1 9. Okay, well, that's your verse, our theme verse that we're going to be learning over the next couple of weeks, and hopefully, we'll be having some fun with these pictures. And actually, with your take home sheets and the, um, the homework sheets that are provided to you, there's going to be some memory verse cards that have these pictures on them. So you can cut those up and use them to remember your verse and to practice with it. So I hope you have fun with those and we might actually use them next week in our lessons. So make sure you've got them cut and you can color them if you like, but have them all ready and prepared because next week we're going to use them as part of our time. All right. So have a great week and we will see you next time. Bye everybody. We have some fun activities to help you remember what we learned today. You know, Joshua had only the first five books of the Bible to guide him, but we have the complete Word of God, 66 books. How much more should we learn and obey God's Word? Here are a few things to do this week that will help us remember. First up, we have two worksheets. The first one has a, a word bank that you can fill in and then has a code that follows the numbers up there and it is a, helps us to remember the central message that Joshua needed to learn and that we need to learn as well. The second one is a blue ribbon. You can print this on blue or color this blue and it's going to help us to remember those things that were Joshua's responsibility that we learned in our lesson today and those promises that God took on himself and gave to Joshua. So those are two of the things that you can do this week. The other thing Mrs. Belanger is going to talk about, your memory verse cards. We're starting a new memory verse and included in your email or in your take-home package this week is going to be the uh, memory verse cards that you can print out, you can color, and you can use them to help you learn our new memory verse, Joshua 1.9 that we learned about today. Also included is going to be a game that you could play with your family, and it, it is something you could set up. You can make the Jordan River and designate some places around your house as the boundaries of the promised land and have some fun with your family exploring the boundaries of the promised land that God promised to the children of Israel and now he is about to fulfill. So you've got some fun things that you can do this week and uh, are able to do with your family to help you remember the things that we've learned. I hope you have a great week and I look forward to seeing you next week. Bye!